I want to talk about the AI cloud, and it's a, it's a concept that we're building at 60.ai. And you know, the subject of the talk in the program was about connecting ourselves to each other and how we need to connect our apps to each other in order to achieve that. And um, I'll go into a little bit about you know, how we're doing that and you know, what we're doing, but mostly I want to cover you know, why this matters and, and why it's important. So can I have the next slide? Or a clicker from somebody? All right, so I'll keep talking. I'm trying to remember what's on the slides, but we are a uh, startup out of Oxford University. Um, we spun out of a computer vision lab there that really invented you know, SLAM or invented augmented reality on mobile phones. And while there, um, I mean, while I was at SuperVentures, I met my current co-founder, Victor, and he showed me some of the research that they've been working on over the last few years. And I realized that we had the potential to solve a, a really frustrating problem with AR. And that problem is that at their best, you know, AR natively is experiential and sensory. And what I mean by that, what I mean by the word native, is that what are those, those experiences that can only be achieved, or only be experienced in AR? It's the things that, it's not just take your smartphone app and put it in front of your face, but there's these unique attributes of AR that can only be experienced that way. And those, you know, those apps, those experiences, they are you know, very, very sensory, and they're you know, highly experiential. And the apps that we've got today, the, the, the potential of the apps today doesn't live up to that, because all our apps today are really disconnected experiences. If you open up an AR Core or AR Kit app, it really just starts, and you, you have a little plane or something on the ground in front of you. And you use it, and you, you, know, you get your little experience, but then you, you shut the app down, and it's, it's gone. And it's just really just you experiencing it on your own. You're not sharing it with anyone else. It's not really connected to that place that you're in, because you know, next time you turn the app on, it could be over there. And it's not really connected to anything in the world around you. And that problem was a difficult problem, because in order to solve that problem, we needed to create some infrastructure to connect these AR apps to each other. The computer vision technology to let one AR experience be shared with another AR experience couldn't really exist on the device. It needed something sort of outside the device to you know, synchronize the, the AR systems on each phone. So that infrastructure is you know, what we're calling the AR cloud. And what it looks like in practice is something like this. You've got three different you know, SLAM systems. We're sort of showing you under the hood of what goes on with something like ARKit. And everyone's got their little point clouds from all different angles. And what the, the AR Cloud does is synchronizes all of those and shares that experience across all those devices. And what it means is we can start doing things like multiplayer. You know, multiplayer is the term we use for you know, an experience that's shared between people, but that's mostly because a lot of the tools and a lot of the people building the first AR experiences come from the gaming world. What it really means is something more like sharing an experience with each other or a social experience or even communicating or collaborating with each other. And so this is a really fundamental enabling you know, aspect of letting these AR apps connect us to each other. Additionally, it starts to leave, you know, enable persistent content. When you put something down in one place, you, want to, you expect naturally to come back the next day or later on, and it's still in that place. It's just we want that, if we're going to suspend disbelief around our AR content, the digital content needs to you know, react or act the way physical content would. And part of that is if you put something in a place and you come back later, it should still be there. And again, that needed to work from my phone and your phone, and if I come back tomorrow, it's still there. So across time and devices. And lastly, the content really needed to feel like it was connected to the world. And Pokemon is a great example of uh, you know, an, an AR experience that really isn't connected to the world. You can cover up the camera playing Pokemon Go, and the, it's the same game. It doesn't really add anything. But what you really want to feel that this stuff is part of the world is that occlusion where that purple, purple Pokemon should be behind the pole, and you see the pole you know, in front of it. 
you want to start to see some physics where the balls bounce off the walls and bounce off the poles and act like it's really in the world. You want some degree of intelligence and understanding about the world. You want to say that, look, this Pokemon should be on the sidewalk, not on the road, and understand the system should know the difference between the road and the sidewalk. And lastly, you want the graphics to look consistent with the real world. You want the lighting to come from the same direction, the shadows to look appropriate. When it's nighttime, things should be dark. And all of those aspects of the AR system are, are really delivered um, through you know, what we're calling AR cloud technology. And how it looks is that really before you can do this, before you can start you know, building your Minecraft world and have some of it on the table and some on the floor and it's hidden behind the couch, you need to be able to capture this, which is a digital model of the real world. And then that digital model is you know, overlaid in your camera on top of the real world so that the digital content starts to or appears to interact with the digital model of the real world and it looks like it's interacting with the physical real world. So that's quite a challenge. It's always been a chicken and egg to solve that problem in that no one was really, it wasn't like Google Street View where you could send you know, cars out to everyone's home and scan your home in and then have it ready there for your next app. And no one was going to build an app until there was some some mesh of the world. And part of what you know, we, we based 60 today on, we founded it on, was some research out of Oxford that let us capture this mesh in real time while the app was running. So the app developers are able to presume that that understanding of the world is already in place, even if it was never there in the past. And it would, our system will just figure that out you know, on the fly. And so what it means after you start to getting that mesh, the next step is to take that a, a step further and start to apply some artificial intelligence, some neural networks, and start to really identify in some detail you know, what things are. So your content can start to behave automatically and appropriately. Like Instead of putting Pokemons in the middle of the freeway, you could have you know, a digital character in your living room come and sit down on your couch because it, it knows there's a couch in the room. So this is a really advanced technology. It's, it's like the bleeding edge of computer vision to sort of get this stuff running on a phone. And obviously, we've, we've got an amazing technical team. Our company's like full of PhDs and sort of postdoctoral researchers. And just getting it to work is an accomplishment that we're, we're quite proud of. But really, the thing that I've learned, I've been in working in AR now for nine, 10 years and been working on these particular problems for nine or 10 years. And one thing that it really has been a, a tough lesson for me to learn is that getting the technology to work just isn't enough. The computer vision itself is a user experience. You know, the, the infrastructure itself is a user experience. And it's not just you know, the application, it's not just the content, but we need to get the, the underlying technology beyond something that works towards something that just works. And anyone who has been around remembers you know, five, six years ago before ARKit and ARCore, you could get the same sort of apps running, but you needed to print out a marker and you needed to hold it in the right spot and you couldn't move your phone to around. The technology worked, but it wasn't until ARKit and ARCore came along that it, it just worked. And that's a really, really hard thing to accomplish. You know, AR on phones was invented in, in the Oxford lab where we spun out of like 10 years ago, and it took that long for it to get to the point where it's consumer grade. And we're now entering that same sort of transition point for these multiplayer or um, persistent types of experiences. And I showed you know, early on with multiplayer, that was a system we built six years ago at Deco, and it, it worked. And now, a week, couple of weeks ago, Google just launched their, their AR cloud anchors. And they're a way to you know, do multiplayer or do you know, semi-persistent content. And uh, I'm not expecting everyone here to have played with them, but if you really want to try it out and use it, there's a, there's a sort of bunch of hoops that you've got to jump through to get the thing working. And that, you know, as I've learned, makes, makes the adoption of the experience probably a, a very, very difficult ask for an end user. So what we're trying to do at 6D is something that hopefully looks really unimpressive in this video. And what this is a little video we caught in our office where we have player one starting an app. OK, it's now joined the, the map of the world. And we'll see this guy. He'll place a bit of content there. He's currently done zero clicks. It's happened within a couple of seconds. 
And then player two is in the background. He's standing you know, reasonable distance away, facing completely the opposite direction. And player two starts his phone, opens it up. The app starts, it loads, it connects, and then he's got the content. So within a couple of seconds on either device, where neither user needed to know anything about the computer vision system that was working, and it was robust enough for them to work from any angle, they were able to get a great, solid user experience. And that's the difference between having to sort of type some information in and come and stand next to me and hold your phone a certain way and getting to the point of something that just works, where you don't need to explain anything about how the underlying system works. So that's the first thing I quickly wanted to show off. Um, the other bit, and this is the first time, as far as I know, this has been shown anywhere in the world by any company, is I showed that mesh, that blue triangle mesh of the couch. And that's always been something that could be done if you had like a, a, a Microsoft Connect or one of those Google Tango phones or a, some sort of depth camera on your device, which has always been you know, a non-starter for mass market phones, you know, especially something that faces the world and has a good range. And so we've now just, like literally just this weekend, um, got this running live on phone. What you're seeing is a, is a screen capture straight from the phone with no sort of effects of a regular smartphone camera actually operating as a depth camera. And it's still a bit rough, it still needs to be tuned, but you'll see it's working outdoors. And as you pan around, you can start to see that monochrome model of the couch get captured. And once it scans, you sort of pan back, and that model there of the, of the little street scene is able then, we'll feed that into your AR experience as that mesh, and you'll have that content that just works and interacts with, you know, with, in this case, with the, the bench and the, the trash can. So we're able to do that over you know, hundreds of meters and eventually build that up into a, a huge world-scale model that just runs in the back of the phone. And this is now, I mean, it's running here, and it's probably four or five weeks away from being in our, our beta code that's available for developers to start playing with. So getting the user experience to be good enough, you know, that's another level of difficulty, but even that isn't really enough. Um, when we're talking about the cloud and the AR cloud, you know, I love this slide, that there is no cloud, it's really just someone else's computer. And so if you're going to be putting you know, the data that your device captures on someone else's computer, that really needs to be managed and with a, with a great degree of stewardship and responsibility. And we've seen how wrong that can go. And the way we're approaching it is that nothing that's personally identifiable should ever leave your phone. So in this case, we've got a little scene of our office. And from our system, everything runs locally on the phone. And that the only things that are pushed up into the cloud are really images that look like this. That's a, a, a point cloud that actually doesn't correspond to the geometric shape of the room and a whole bunch of sort of mathematical descriptors of each of those points. And we've developed this in a way where it cannot be reverse engineered into a image you know, to, to the best of any science available today. So even if you know, the government came to us and said, hey, look, we need this data and we need to look inside your, your home, we, it's just technically impossible to do that. So that, uh, you know, that responsibility around privacy and managing that data, I think, is something that, um, you know, as a startup, we've got the, the freedom to align you know, our values with our customers' and end users' values. And it's, uh, it's an area where a lot of the big platforms are certainly going to have challenges in um, you know, earning the trust of, of people. But so again, even that's not enough. Because at the end of the day, you know, what's the point of all of this? You know, why are we doing it where you know, a set of APIs that are secure and private and easy to use it doesn't really mean much in itself? There's got to be a, a purpose for these APIs. And for that, our sort of true north is to enable people's creative potential. And as an you know, example of that, we've just, we're just announcing that uh, Sashka Unseld has, is joining our team as our creative strategist. And Sashka was you know, created at Pixar, the Blue Umbrella short film, if you've seen that. He's won Emmy Awards for his work where he co-founded Oculus Story Studio. And Sashka's going to be working with us to, to do a couple of things, to help our you know, our PhDs understand what to build and not 
because it's easy to go off on lots of tangents, but to say, look, here's a creative vision that we can enable. And secondly, to work with some of our biggest customers to help them understand the difference between you know, a gimmick and something that's going to be compelling or something that's just a nice idea versus something that's impossible. So we're super excited to have someone of you know, his potential working with us to make sure that what our customers build is going to be you know, truly world class. And at the end of the day, we really are working to change how you see the world, literally and metaphorically. You know, that's what 6D is about and why you know, we're doing this. So thank you. That was my last slide. Um, I am open for any questions now. We're pretty short on time, but you can grab me afterwards uh, if you don't get a chance right now. So thank you. Thank you.